Thank you, Karen. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to Acts chapter 15 today? Let me first say, um, very excited for you guys the next three weeks. Um, you get to hear different voices. Uh, and one thing of having been here 32 years, uh, there are only so many Christmas messages that can come that you haven't heard before. So you get to hear some fresh voices uh, in the next three weeks. And what a blessing it is that we'll have lay people, our own people will be speaking to us. And so next week, Eric Brown will be standing where I am. And then on Christmas Eve, two weeks from today, we'll be meeting at the Focus Center at 1030, not 11, at 1030. Kemper will be preaching that morning. And then we'll be back here December 31st, New Year's Eve. And Paul Singer will be preaching at 11 that day. I do want to emphasize there will not be an evening Christmas Eve service this year. Since Christmas Eve is on Sunday, we'll have the one service that morning. You know, the late theologian, John R. W. Stott had a, a brilliant mind, and I remember when I first pick, uh, purchased the commentary uh, that he wrote on the book of Acts, and I was reading through that this week, and I love how he described what is happening here in Acts chapter 15 as we looked last week, and as we continue our look in Acts chapter 15 this week. Uh, he said, really, what was happening in the book of Acts inevitably led to where we are here in Acts chapter 15. As the gospel was moving to various nations, it was inevitable that the church would have to have an authoritative meeting to make a decision on what God was doing. And we'll see today that God led that decision. He was at the center of it. It, it removed confusion and it allowed a clarity that the gospel might continue. It wasn't that God uh, needed that meeting. It was that the people needed that meeting so that they could be on the same uh, page as God. And so as we've been looking in the book of Acts, the gospel is moving forward. Peter preached at Pentecost. The people were dispersed. In Acts chapter uh, 10, we see a significant event as Peter meets a man, Cornelius, who is a Gentile, a centurion. He leads Cornelius and his family to the Lord. And so the gospel is moving in a new direction. Then we move on into Acts chapter 11 and the gospel as people are spreading around the known world has reached Antioch of Syria. Syria was not a Jewish territory, but the gospel had reached there. And we see a single church that was embracing the gospel. Many Gentiles believe. Then as we have looked for the last two or three months, we see Paul's missionary journey as it didn't stop there at Syria, but it moved into parts of southern Galatia. Many people believed Jews and Gentiles alike. And I like how uh, John Stott describes it in the beginning of this particular chapter. And he says this, a trickle of Gentile conversions all of a sudden was becoming a torrent. There was a great movement. It wasn't just one family in Cornelius. It wasn't just one church, but the gospel was spreading to new territories and the church was at a point of crisis, not in a negative way, but in a positive way. You see, the Jews knew that the gospel was to be for the nations. That should not surprise them, any knowledgeable one. When you read Isaiah and you read other parts, the Psalms, it's understood that the gospel was to flow through the Jews to the Gentiles, that all peoples were to believe that the Jews were to be a light to the world. The issue was not that. The issue was how would these Gentiles be assimilated into the faith? And there were people who we saw last week, like the Judaizers, who felt like the Gentiles must, in order to be right with God, become Jewish proselytes. In other words, they must take on the Jewish way of life, that the only way they could be right with God is to take on also certain aspects of the law. Specifically, we saw circumcision. And so they were saying it's not enough. And my, might I add, they were saying wrongly, it's not enough for a Gentile to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but they must become like we are in order to be right with God. And so we see that this council in Jerusalem made up of apostles and elders, a God-ordained council, as we see today, led by the Holy Spirit, 
Spirit comes to the conclusion that it is only faith in Christ that is needed for someone to enter right standing with God. Look with me at the Acts chapter 15 beginning in verse 22. So it says, then the apostles and the elders with the whole church, that is in Jerusalem, who had come to this decision, they decided to select men who were among them and to send them to Antioch. Why to Antioch? Because that's where the issue arose. That's where the gospel was, that was sort of the central station, the missionary sending station. It's to send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, Judas called Barsabbas. This isn't Judas Iscariot. Uh, that betrayed the Lord, but a different Judas, and Silas, both leading men among the brothers. They wrote, from the apostles and the elders, your brothers, to the brothers and sisters among the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some without our authorization went out from us and troubled you with their words and unsettled your hearts, we have unanimously decided to select men and send them to you along with our dearly loved Barnabas and Paul, who have risked their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we have sent Judas and Silas, who will personally report the same things by word of mouth, for it was the Holy Spirit's decision and ours, not to place further burdens on you beyond these requirements that you abstain from food offered to idols, from blood, from eating anything that has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. You will do well if you keep yourselves from these things. Farewell. So they were sent off and went down to Antioch, and after gathering the assembly, they delivered the letter. When they read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. Both Judas and Silas, who were also prophets themselves, encouraged the brothers and sisters and strengthened them with a long message. After spending some time there, they were sent back in peace by the brothers and sisters to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas, along with many others, remained in Antioch teaching and proclaiming the word of God. After some time had passed, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the brothers and sisters in every town where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this great sovereign act, the decision, Lord, made by your handpicked apostles and elders to clarify the gospel, not just in that generation but in all time, that, Lord, it is through faith in Jesus Christ that a person becomes right with God. There's nothing we can add from it, nothing we take away from it. Lord, there is no other God but him, and so we acknowledge you today. Pray you would speak your truth in Jesus' name. Amen. So really the context is this, as we've looked the past couple of months, uh, we mentioned that guy that had traveled a bicycle for a, a number of miles, but think about this, Paul and Barnabas were really burning up the trail. We know for almost a year they had traveled from Antioch into southern Galatia. They were going to various cities like uh, Antioch of Pisidia, Lystra, Derby, and the like, Iconium, and they were traveling from town to town, and they were preaching the gospel of Christ. Then after they completed completed that, they arrived back in Antioch to the sending church. They shared the report and we saw that they faced adversity there, that there were opponents, there were Judaizers, there were people who were sending a conflicting message that was wrong and they were uh, working against Paul and Silas. So as they had time to cool their heels there a while, they needed to settle these matters. So they went from Antioch down to Jerusalem where they received the ruling and now they're heading back to Antioch. But this was really an exciting trip for them. I'm sure there was a skip in their step as they were heading from Jerusalem and heading back to Antioch because in a way they could say, aha, we are right. What God is doing here is a work of God and that the Gentiles are truly coming and it's through faith in Christ in Christ alone. But we know that there would still be adversity. And so as we look at it here, and we see that Paul and Barnabas are along with Silas and uh, Barsabbas, also named Judah, Judas, they were returning to Antioch from the council that we looked at last week and were able to read a letter that they sent that described the ruling of these ones in authority in Jerusalem. And as we look at this ruling, as 
we look at the letter today, which is really included from verses 23 to 29, the content of that letter, I want to see four things that were accomplished by this ruling as described uh, by the Jerusalem Council in this letter. And the first is this, this ruling, this letter established orthodoxy regarding the gospel. Now the word orthodoxy is a, is a, a, a $5 word which means an authorized opinion or theory or doctrine. In this case, it was authoritative doctrine. Orthos means right. That's why when you go to an orthopedic doctor, they take what is fractured or and not straight and they straighten it out. Orthos means right or straight. Doxos means praise, but it also means opinion. And so what uh, the Jerusalem church did is they did this. They established orthodoxy in regard to the gospel of Jesus Christ, a correct opinion a correct doctrine about the gospel, a correct view as to how someone comes to right standing with God. You see, that's a big aspect of salvation. Salvation has to do not only with us being saved from our sin, it most certainly means that, not only has to do that we're saved from the consequences of our sin, which is true, but it also carries the idea that we have entered into a right standing with God. Every person should desire to know that that he or she is in right standing with God. And so the letter from Jerusalem begins with a point of clarity. And so they sent this letter out and they said basically this, we see in verse 24, that people, we want you to know church at Antioch, these people who came to you earlier and were challenging the message of Paul and Barnabas, they were not sent from our authority. They were unauthorized. They brought a wrong message. And we know that the this work, it was contradicting the work of Paul, and he goes on to say that it troubled and unsettled them. It unsettled their hearts. It was really a disturbance. And so very clearly, uh, the ruling body in Jerusalem sent this letter, along with two personally, to, to authenticate that, yes, this indeed is what the church of Jerusalem did. They said, we do not want them to hinder you. Now, how did these in authority come to their conclusion? How did they develop orthodoxy? They didn't just sit around and take a straw poll. They didn't just sit around and say, well, I think this, this is my thought on this. The scripture is very clear in verse 28. It was the Holy Spirit's decision, the Spirit of God, the very person of God, and us, and you can see how it's written, almost the idea that the priority is God himself did it, and we have come to agreement that this is the case. That's when an individual is ordained. We think about the church is saying, we authorize that person. No, an ordination of a candidate into ministry or the deaconship is that more like we acknowledge it's God who's done that and we are adjusting ourselves in an agreement with God that we see evidence of this. And so as the Church of Jerusalem is writing, it's not that they were some pontificating group just on their own that was making this decision. They were saying, the Holy Spirit led us to this, and it is also our agreement not to place any further burdens from you. And so basically what they're saying is that the orthodoxy regarding salvation is this. Faith in Jesus alone saves a person. It's not faith plus anything else. It is believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder today, have you placed your trust in Jesus Christ? It's the most important decision you ever make in your life. If you will give him, if you will make that right in your life, if you will adjust yourself to the right doctrine, to the belief that Jesus is saved, God will make straight your path. He will make clear. Paul himself said, I don't set aside the grace of God through Jesus Christ for if I could gain right standing with God through what I do, my works, my effort, then Christ died in vain. And what he is basically saying is if I could get to God by my works, by my goodness, if we want to call it that, then why would God have sent Jesus Christ to die for me? You see, Jesus died because he alone, he alone is the way. And so we see that this letter established 
orthodoxy regarding the gospel. But I want you to see a second thing. It promoted peace among the believers, Jew and Gentile alike. There was great wisdom in this letter because not only did they clarify how a person enters right standing with God, and we should not be surprised by that because God's Spirit is leading this. But it's important to know that the instruction went beyond just how someone personally would gain right standing with God. They made that very clear through faith in Christ. Nothing to be added to it. But it also addressed a second thing. It addressed unity in the church. And so we see that this letter is trying to clarify how individually does a person come to right standing with God. That is through faith in the work of Christ, in Christ's death and resurrection. But he adds to that four other admonitions, four other requirements that are, that are listed there. We talked about those last week. The four, one had to do with the moral law, to avoid sexual immorality. And that's clear. It's not becoming or characteristic of the Christian life to be living a sexually immoral life. The Christian life is to be separated from that. That's God's moral law, and any Christian should take that seriously. But there are also three other things that are listed, and we see them listed um, in verses uh, 28 and 29. He said also that you abstain from food offered to idols, from blood, and from eating anything that has been strangled. Now those things had not to do with the moral law, they had to do with God's ceremonial law. And God's moral law and ceremonial law, while they're both laws, they are distinct one from the other. The moral laws are timeless. Uh, from now to eternity, we can be sure that sexual immorality is not God's will. But the ceremonial laws were different. They were often given and presented that the people might understand God. In one way we might look at the ceremonial law as God was introducing himself generation by generation to the people would be like the instruction we would give a three-year-old child. Were we to leave out of here today and a three-year-old child and, and if we desired to go across the road to the cemetery with a three-year-old child you may say now don't you cross that child without an adult. And so you take that hand of that child and go across. But wouldn't it be strange if you saw me after church and you said, Pastor Rick, don't you cross that road without holding my hand? Why do we say that to a child? What are we really teaching? We're teaching that child respect the road. It can be dangerous. Once that's grasped, once that concept is grasped, you don't need to go back and do that. And so all of the ceremonial law basically was teaching God is different. God is other than we are. God has these things. The problem was many people were taking those and as they were maturing in the faith, they were returning turning back to these elemental things that did not lead to someone having right standing with God. Yet here, and follow this, you would say, okay, you're saying all of this. Now, why would they say it's faith in Christ alone, but why are they giving these instructions, these three things that are added? I'm glad you asked. Um, the issue is this. These three things that are added had nothing to do with a person's right standing with God, but it had a lot to do with the advancement of the gospel. These things in and of themselves, while not really moral issues, we know could hinder people if they reverted back to things associated with idolatry. But more than that, these things could be offensive to the Jewish believers. Because as we've looked through this first missionary journey, what, we, what have we seen? We've seen Jewish believers, we've seen Jewish opponents, we've seen Jewish believers and Gentile believers alike. In other words, when, Paul, when, the, when the church at Jerusalem through Paul and Barnabas and Silas and those who've come back said, it's faith in Christ alone, but we do require these things, they weren't required for right standing. They were required so there would not be a hindrance 
to the gospel. You know, the gospel's going to new areas, and Lord willing, if, if I'm able to be back and I'm praying God's strength to come back in January, we're going to be looking at the second missionary journey. And before the second missionary journey, Paul has young Timothy circumcised. Timothy had a Jewish mother, but a Gentile father. And you would say, why in the world has Paul argued that it is only through faith in Jesus? Then why is he having Timothy circumcised? Not to make Timothy right with God, but so as not to hinder the gospel that was going to Jewish people. Why needlessly have a conflict? Why needlessly have this speed bump when Jews would say, well, he's not been circumcised. Who is he in the authority. Well, Paul said, this is a minor thing for the sake of the gospel as a whole. Peter's right. I mean, Timothy's right without it. Yet for the sake of not hindering the gospel, he had Timothy circumcised. And so why are they giving these added instructions of the ceremonial law, not to make an individual right with God, but so as not to hinder the advancement of of the gospel. A verse I came across to, well, a verse and a half I came across about six months ago I'd never thought about is Romans 15 verses 2 in the first part of verse 3. Listen to it. It says, each one of us is to please his neighbor. Well, first of all, people pleaser? Is this Paul speaking? But let's finish it. Each one of us is to please his neighbor for his own good to build him up. It's not pleasing somebody to, to be a people pleaser, to get something from somebody. He said, but please your neighbor for his own good to build him up. And then he said, for Christ did not please himself. In other words, in, in effect, this ruling from the Jerusalem church is saying, why needlessly have this conflict? <coughs> So follow this for the sake of gospel advancement. They were given to promote unity and to advance the gospel. That's why those three ceremonial laws were included. Well, let's see a third thing. What did this letter, this ruling and the letter, subsequent letter, uh, accomplish? It accelerated the advancement of the gospel. The conflict was causing a cessation or stopping of the advancement of the gospel. You say, well, how is that? Well, what do we see Paul and Barnabas doing now? They're having by foot to go from Antioch to Jerusalem to try to settle this matter. That could have been time they would have spent advancing the gospel. And it was an important step, don't get me wrong. But if it had not been settled, there would be a continual conflict. But I want you to notice in verses 35 and 36, after they returned with the letter with Paul and with Barsabbas, it said, Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch. And what were they doing? Teaching and proclaiming the word of the Lord. And then in verse 36, we see the seeds for the beginning of a second missionary journey. Ironically, Paul and Barnabas would end up not being together, but they had their sights set on advancing the gospel. So when this ruling came from Jerusalem, not only did it define what orthodoxy is in regard to the gospel, not only did it seek to unify Jews and Gentiles, but it actually accelerated the advancement of the gospel. I was laughing. I was trying to think of how to illustrate it this week, and I thought I had a brilliant idea of what would happen if you had a splinter in your foot. Then I went over to the gym and moved something. I got a splinter in my finger. I haven't had a splinter in I don't know how long. But there's a difference between having a splinter in your foot and a splinter in your finger. If I have a splinter in my finger, as long as it's not rubbing against something, it's okay. As soon as I grab something, boy, pain shoots through it. But what if it's right on the pressure point of your foot? Every time you put that foot down, you're walking gingerly. You're not walking confidently. You're probably walking more slowly. You're limping as you go. And as we look at this... These, these Jews that were bringing the wrong, the wrong teaching, it was hindering the advancement of the gospel. It was like a splinter in the foot. Paul and them, they were still moving, but they were having to stop and give attention to things. And the council settled this later, letter. The, the letter settled this issue. And so we see that it accelerated the advancement of the gospel. But I want you to see a, a final thing. It, the council... The letter affirmed the work of God. You know, over the years, I've worked with youth and children a whole lot. And I've learned one thing when you work with children in whatever area, 
that be careful of self-fulfilling prophecy. I'm always careful what I tell a child. I try to say, you won't ever do this or you can't do this. Because usually what you say, that seed goes in the mind. If you say, well, you can't do math, maybe they can't do math, but you say, we're going to get better at it. See the difference? Because uh, confidence affects performance. And so if I'm planting a seed of doubt in a child, that child is going to fulfill it. And, and I hope I've done okay with my children. I haven't been perfect, but for young parents, be aware of that. I'm not telling you to, to masquerade everything and pretend everything's hunky-dory, but if you're going to err, err on the side of confidence in your children. And so we see here, here was a young movement of the gospel. It needed confidence. Paul and Barnabas were confident, but guess what? The Jerusalem council gave them even more confidence. And so it said that, that what was accomplished through this, look at verse 32. Both Judas and Silas, uh, who had returned to give a personal stamp of approval on this letter, who were also prophets themselves, what did they do? They encouraged the brothers and the sisters and strengthened them with a long message. In other words, this letter, this ruling, encouraged them. It says, yes, you're right. Keep doing Doing what you're doing. You know, we need to advance the gospel ourselves, but we need to encourage those who are doing the same. That's why our missionary who's out there, our giving will encourage him. He, he knows that the church is with him. One way that we as Southern Baptists can encourage our missionaries is by giving to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, which goes to carry the gospel around the world. You know, a prayer that I pray from time to time is this, Lord, bless and encourage your most fatigued and discouraged missionary in the world. Have you ever thought about that? There are probably tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of missionaries around the world. There's one now who's having the most difficult time who needs encouragement. When this letter came back with the personal uh, touch of, of Silas and Barsabbas, it gave the church at Antioch encouragement. You know, we need that encouragement here. We need to encourage those who teach us, those who prepare food for us, those who minister to us, whether it be social committee, recreation committee, our music uh, ministry, all of these things encourage one another. That's what this letter did. <coughs> one group of brothers encouraging others. So this letter so short in content, was so profound in its impact on the gospel. And you know what? You and I, some 2,000 years later, <clears throat> we are still benefiting from it. You know, I have a great appreciation for those who have gone before me. I think about this church from time to time. It was founded 173 years ago. I'm thankful that a group of individuals got together and decided, you know what? We need to start a fellowship here. That's why we're here today. God prompting individuals, just as the Holy Spirit prompted the Jerusalem Council. I'm thankful um, that some 70 years ago, as individuals who were members of the church at this time made their way to a place just to my left, to my right in the parking lot and watched the wood frame building of the church burn because the furnace caught on fire. I'm thankful that they didn't just pack it in and say, well, I guess we'll just give it up. But they kept the ministry going. They rebuilt the church and the building that we're sitting in right now. I'm thankful for that. And I am also thankful for Paul and Barnabas who are described, I think it's in verse 26, risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. They could have easily acquiesced and said, well, we just won't stand on the truth, but they risked their lives. I'm thankful for the Jerusalem Council who had under the unction of the Holy Spirit the boldness to stand on the truth so that the gospel would be clearly proclaimed. I'm thankful for it. And so as we close today, really the question is this. It's a twofold question. 
Have you believed the gospel, the orthodox gospel? Have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Such great pain, such great risk, such great effort was given that it might be preserved. Why? So that even today, in December of 2023, you can hear the truth that if a person would repent of his or her sins, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that one would be saved. Have you done that? Have you trusted Christ and Christ alone? I pray you've done that today. But secondly, if you have done that, are you carrying the gospel? Are you encouraging those who are doing the ministry? This gospel that is deemed so valuable that they had a very important counsel years and years ago. Are you carrying that gospel to others? Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word today, your word is truth. We thank you, Lord, for this ruling and the letter that was sent out to the churches that made very clear that a person gains right standing with God through faith in Jesus Christ and his work alone. We thank you how with the added instruction that it served to promote unity, how, Lord, also that it advanced the gospel as this issue was settled so that the church didn't have to have the pain of the splinter of division, but they were able to move freely. And, Lord, also... Just, God, how you have worked in encouraging the church over the years, those who have done your work, and how this letter served to encourage your faithful servants. Father, there may be some today who have never trusted Christ. I pray today would be the day of salvation for them, and I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.